Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramnin and with me from the Bangalore studio is Ritu Singh. And these are the top headlines from the startup world. Boat raises 500 crore rupees from its existing shareholder Warburg Pinkis and new investor Malabar Investments to fuel the expansion of its business. The company has also withdrawn its plans to go public but may consider an IPO in the next 12 to 18 months. Elon Musk tweets the bird is freed, signaling his takeover of Twitter. Sources tell CNBC, Twitter CEO Parag Agarwal, CFO Ned Segal and policy chief Vijay Gade have been fired with severance costs totaling up to $200 million. Musk is likely to take charge as interim CEO. Flipkart Internet records a 31% year-on-year jump in its revenues to over 10,600 crore rupees from the financial year 2022. The Walmart-owned company, however, saw its net loss widen 51% to a little over 4,300 crore rupees during the fiscal on the back of rising transportation, marketing and legal charges. Apple's global iPhone sales fall short even as revenue from India hits a record high. Amazon shares also plunge after sluggish holiday sales forecast. The big tech route continues on Wall Street with $800 billion in valuation getting wiped out just this week. Chinese smartphone maker Xiaomi shut down its financial services business in India. The company pulled its um, pay and uh, credit apps in India from the local Play Store and its own app store. It's now, MePay is also no longer listed among the recognized by UPI operator NPCI. Well, those were the headlines we're tracking on Startup Street, but let's start with the big earnings today. Flipkart Internet has recorded a 31% year-on-year jump in its revenues to over 10,600 crore rupees for the financial year 2022. The Walmart-owned company, however, saw its net losses widen by 51% over the previous year. Shilpa Rani Peter is here with the numbers. Shilpa, take us through the fine print. Well, like you said, Flipkart's uh, FY22 earnings saw its revenues grow about 31% and that was to about 10,659 uh, crore rupees year on year. And the revenues here were led by its marketplace services, logistic management and advertising services that the company offers. Now remember Flipkart Internet is Flipkart's marketplace uh, arm that mainly generates its revenues from e-commerce, IT-enabled services, market uh, marketplace and other related services. Now net loss, however, widened to by over one and a half times uh, to about 4,300 now, crore. Now, this is up from about 2,881 crores in the previous fiscal. Now, the net loss widened on the back of rising transportation costs, advertising and legal expenses. Now, total expenses were up about 36.5% to about 15,000 uh, crore rupees. And this was, like I said, led by a total cost of transportation that was actually up over 46%. Legal expenses were up about 1.4 times for the company. And advertising and promotion expenses also up about 81% year on year to about 1900 crore rupees now remember this comes at a time where the e-commerce industry especially flipkart and other companies also have been seeing rising inflation that is eating into their profits and also at a time when there's intense competition among from other e-commerce e-commerce marketplaces as well back to you all right shilpa thank you so much for bringing us those details but moving on on what's brewing imagine marketing the parent company of audio gear and wearables brand boat has withdrawn its plans to go public after it raised 500 crore rupees in a fresh round of funding the funds were raised via private placement through preference shares to existing investor warburg pinkis and new investor malabar investments well, according to SEBI's guidelines, Boat was allowed to raise 20% of the IPO amount, which is up to 180 crore rupees in the pre-IPO round. But with this latest round of funding, it has raised more than 500 crores in equity. And so the company has proactively withdrawn its DRHP. Remember, in January of this year, Imagine Marketing had filed papers with SEBI to raise up to 2,000 crores through this IPO. This latest fundraise, growth plans and its decision to not go public yet. Joining us now is Vivek Gambhir, the CEO of Boat and my colleague Ritu Singh. Vivek, uh, congratulations on this fundraise and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Now, first up, why the decision to shelve your IPO plans? Is it more to do with the choppy market conditions or not being able to get the valuation you wanted? Or is it simply because you've been able to raise the required capital in the private market? Yeah, yeah good evening. Wonderful to talk to you all. Uh, you know, going public is a question of uh, when, not if for us. And so we fully intend to go public at the right time. Three reasons for uh, us to take a temporary pause. One is we are seeing tremendous opportunities in the variables or the smartwatches segment. 
Uh, as we all know, we are clear leaders in the audio segment where we are number one in India and number two globally. And so we intend to replicate the audio story in the variable segment and become leaders there. And so the idea for delaying the IPO was to invest significantly in the variable space. The second is, as we spoke to investors, we found so much interest in both that even without doing a formal process of fundraising, we were able to secure these funds uh, in a very short amount of time, which shows the confidence and conviction investors have in the both story. And the third, as you were mentioning, is market conditions are somewhat choppy right now. So we thought it's prudent to wait for some time, scale the variables business, and definitely hit the markets in the, real, in the near future when conditions are more conducive. And what, uh, Vivek, would that near future be? We understand it's going to be about 12 to 18 months. And also, uh, you know, during that time, will this 500 crore rupee suffice? Because uh, when you did file your DRHP, you were looking at 2,000 crore rupee raise. So how long is this 500 crore going to meet your funding requirements? Yeah. You know, the board story even today is very compelling. Uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, track record in growth. We have crossed 3,000 crores in uh, revenue. We have been a profitable business since inception uh, with leading market share in our category and a very strong brand with the highest brand of Venice in the category. So the story itself today is also quite compelling, but we thought it's better to wait for some time and scale up the variables business. This amount of funding is, uh, I think, more than enough for us to tide us till the IPO. Our balance sheet is also very strong. Our net debt to equity is about 0.5. And so we have a, we have a strong balance sheet uh, and definitely, I think this amount of money will enable us to uh, to be able to get to uh, the IPO stage. So you have a strong balance sheet and this is enough money to tide you over till the IPO. But speaking about the 500 crore rupee fundraise, what is the valuation you've worked out? Is there a minimum valuation cap as part of the deal with these investors? Yeah, you know, I've been hearing a lot of speculation all day about a 12,000 crore uh, valuation number. Uh, I would not want to comment on it. Uh, this is a convertible uh, structure, as you were mentioning, preference shares uh, that will be tied to the next round, which hopefully will be the IPO. Well, no comment on uh, the valuation, Vivek, from you, but tell us how you plan to use this capital because you want to invest to disrupt the smartwatches space, uh, make that your second core after the personal audio category. What are the plans on that front? Because, you know, between the Chinese smartwatches at the low end, uh, you know, your competitors like Firebolt and Noise, and then, of course, Apple at the highest end, where will you look to solidify your position with this expansion? And you've sort of slipped to the third position, uh, you know, in, in this space after Noise and Bolt. So tell us your plans on both the fronts. Yeah, you know, we were a relatively late entrant in the smartwatches space. And so we've been in this category for only about 18 months or, or so. And during this period, uh, both Storm and both Extend have been the best selling smartwatches in the country. Our range was quite limited uh, because we had entered late in the category. But over the last couple of months, the range has expanded significantly. And even today, watches like Wave Call are the best selling watches in the, the country. The uh, market today is quite cluttered. Uh, while there is growth, we are even more excited about the growth uh, ahead. A lot of players are playing with fairly rudimentary uh, you know, offerings. Uh, our belief is that we actually have some very differentiated capabilities. Uh, we acquired Kaha Technologies, which is a world-class uh, variables technology platform. And uh, I think the one big difference is that for most of the existing competition, they are white labeling the platform and the app from Chinese vendors. We have our own proprietary platform that we have built through Kaha with about 64 patents and patent applications. So we have some very strong IP. And the reason for controlling the platform is that we are able to offer far more reliable features. We are able to provide products far quicker. We can provide much more advanced features and provide much more deeper analytics. So the game here for us is to actually move from being a device company to actually a platform play that enables consumers to lead fitter and healthier lifestyles. And that's going to be the big differentiation that we will bring by investing significantly in marketing, in branding, in product development, uh, in IP and R&D. And we are very confident that over the next couple of years, you will see us being able to become market leaders here. So while we did start late, I think we definitely have the playbook in place uh, and a clear plan to become market leaders in this category 
very similar to what we did in the audio uh, audio category. All right, so you have your playbook ready there. But let's talk about your revenues then. How much of the revenue contribution would come from smartphones and how much from audio, gaming, personal care and mobile accessories over the short to medium term? What is the current mix? Yeah, the current mix is about 25% uh, is uh, from smartwatches. This number was about 16% last year. So our smartwatch uh, business is going over 100% year on year. And while audio is also growing very rapidly, our audio is about 65% of our portfolio, and the remaining 10% is gaming and accessories. All right. Uh, you know, Vivek, what about diversifying your manufacturing footprint? Because currently you do have partnerships. Uh, you are manufacturing, uh, you know, some products in India, about 1 million units every month, we understand. Uh, to what extent could this be scaled in your plans to take both uh, the brand overseas as well? Yeah. Uh, you know, this has been one of the biggest changes that have happened in the business over the last six months. And I'm very proud of what the team's been able to achieve. Last year, almost all of our products were produced in China. Uh, this year, in the first six months of the year, six million units have been produced in India. We are now averaging about one million units every month. And along with, I think, uh, making in India, the next big shift we are making is actually design in India. So we are building deep design capabilities we have uh, both labs. It's a 120% R&D team that's actually focused on design R&D. And so you will start seeing the shift from not just make in India, but also design in India. And along with our JV partner, Dixon Technologies, we're really working on trying to create this entire ecosystem in India so that the value add portion of manufacturing keeps on increasing in India. So early days, uh, but the, 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 the trajectory looks very positive. And we are seeing some great traction in terms of being able to actually uh, make India a global manufacturing hub. Uh, As the India global manufacturing hub gains scale, we definitely see more potential to take the board brand overseas. We don't have any specific plans yet, but over the next 12 months or so, we will put our plans together and to be able to take the brand overseas. We believe that uh, both stands for convenience, uh, for quality, for great lifestyle and affordable pricing. And that proposition will resonate in many other parts of the world as well. So I think over the next two or three years, definitely we look forward to taking the boat brand overseas as well. So it's going to take two or three years to see boat go overseas. Vivek, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And we wish you all the best with your plans going forward. Thank you. Wonderful talking to you. Absolutely. On that note, it is time for us to head into a short break. But coming up next, drone startup Sky Air Mobility iced $15 million in a Series A funding round after changing its flight route towards the drone as a service model. A special conversation with the CEO, Ankit Kumar, on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back here on Startup Street. Now, do, uh, drone startup Sky Air Mobility is eyeing $15 million in a Series A funding round after changing its flight route towards drone as a service model. My colleague Ashwarya Anand caught up with its CEO Ankit Kumar on the sidelines side lines of uh, Jitex Global in Dubai to talk more about this and began by asking him about the company's tie-up with Flipkart Health for long-range medicine delivery. Listen in. So we partner with Flipkart to take up drone deliveries as a mainstream solution compared to the conventional means which are there today. As a part of that, we conducted a 15 days of pre-commercial trial with all the SLAs in place to ensure that we are able to achieve and have maximum utilization of such drones. We did over 200 plus flights and as a part of that initiative, we also did 104 kilometers uh, BV loss of medicine delivery which set across uh, a kind of a world record with respect to medicine delivery to be carried to that long. Now, while we were doing this, you know, we were able to save 80% of the time and over 10 to 15% of the cost while we did such kind of deliveries to far long areas because it makes a lot of commercial sense for companies to adopt and start utilizing drones at a large scale. Now, you know, uh, it's being uh, believed that uh, the way that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the way it's been structured, healthcare, Will be the large, will be the largest uh, adopter of uh, commercial drone delivery. What is your take on this, and how are you planning to capitalize on this opportunity? So I would say healthcare is certainly going to be the first adopter of it, and that is because of the fact that uh, time is uh, time is more sensitive here, and uh, 
the kind of criticality that is involved with people moving around and saving lives uh, is very much realized in the healthcare sector. So it's going to be the first mover, it's going to be a bigger market opportunity for drone delivery companies as such. But then again, quick commerce and e-commerce, etc., is also flourishing and those industries will kick off and start doing it, things at scale. So now that you're already into healthcare, defense, and uh, you've also uh, partnered with Cure Foods recently to uh, deliver uh, frozen foods uh, to cloud kitchens. So tell me, how is that partnership working out for you? And are there more sectors that you're planning to enter into in the, by the end of this year? Industries where you know uh, people are looking at saving time and, and bringing up better efficiency is where we are trying to enter into. With Cure Foods, the idea was that let's try to get in more detail, let's try to get in more uh, of taking our frozen food and maintaining a temperature at minus 20, we were able to deliver that successfully. Now we are taking that up with a 50 kilos drone, which will be doing such deliveries to their cloud kitchen. So that means your food, which is being delivered today in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, will become much faster in the coming time frame to go for. While you're offering uh, drone services, uh, you do not manufacture for third party, right? But you do build your own drones. But you're now making a shift to the drone as a service model. Help us make sense of the move and uh, you know, uh, how is it going to pro propel the next leg of growth for the country? So we believe, you know, not everything can be done by yourself. We did develop certain models and certain platforms. and Those are working well. We are shifting to a contract manufacturers now to develop and build that at scale because what we need right now is production at scale. We need to deploy 150 drones, 200 drones in the next six months. And if we have to achieve that, we need to concentrate on single point of solution, which is we being focused on the operation side of it and the software side of it. So there is a shift which is more in alignment with what we are what we are willing to achieve. And with the with reference to the number of drones that we need to deploy, we believe that this is the right option to go ahead with and let rely on different OEMs and different contract manufacturers to support us. You know, now with India uh, open for drone manufacturers, like with India opening up for drone manufacturers uh, due to the PLI scheme and uh, other uh, policy moves, the government is pegging, uh, you know, uh, an investment of rupees 5,000 crores on the manufacturing side, and they're seeing uh, they're, they're seeing a uh, 30 cro 30,000 crore rupees industry, right? Uh, so it's 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 natural for us to understand that uh, you know why the interest of the big conglomerates are into this space. But uh, keeping that in mind, I want to understand that in terms of, uh, you know, with them coming into the space, what is the competition looking like for the startups in this in the place? And how do you think uh, is this uh, is consolidation going to be the future in the sector? See, consolidation on the manufacturing front for sure can be there, and with the big players jumping into the market, it's 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 a you know a sort of a satisfaction that now you have a you have a product built out in here in India which is going to a global scale and global market altogether. And with such companies coming in, it's not a competition to us, rather it's a, it's a one of our suppliers to us who can, who can uh, look into building up drones that we can utilize in the fleet. The market is huge and uh, as it's growing, it's, it's becoming more better and uh, more deeper altogether. Uh, with reference to the drone delivery, our, our, our total addressable market today stands to be around $26 billion, just on the first mile and last mile. And if you look at that sort of a market today, we need a lot of drones, we need a lot of uh, ecosystem developers to come in place and start creating and start giving in more support to the ecosystem to grow. So it's, it's a good thing that the PLI came in, which is giving a boost to the overall domestic market. And slowly and gradually things are increasing in that way. And we would like more reliance to happen in the domestic sector rather than we buying products and we buying components from other countries. All right. Now, on the commercial front, tell me how has the company's growth been? What kind of earnings are you projecting? Uh, you raised uh, seed capital. You've raised seed capital till now. Are there plans to raise more capital to you know fuel your growth further? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the, the industry has just started. I mean, in, in, the, in the drone delivery industry, uh, the things have just started moving up, right? We're expecting this year to close around 900K to a million dollar is where we are expecting the revenues to flow in. We have 22 odd clients, we are building up more clients. We are going to around 40 clients by the end of this year. And we'll be doing multiple activities with them. We are opening our Series A uh, here in Dubai uh, tomorrow. And uh, How much are you raising? Talking. We're raising 15 million. Oh, great. And uh, we are going ahead with a lot of investors. We're going ahead with a lot of discussions with those investors. 
to look into what we can build and how we can build. The idea is not just to be limited ourselves to India. We are, we are growing domestically a lot and we want to keep that growth uh, at the same par, but we also want to grow to other markets and this fund will be utilized towards those things as well. It is Friday and it's time to take stock of how the startup space fared this week in terms of new deals. 12 new deals took place this week, valued at over $200 million. This according to Venture Intelligence. Some notable deals include B2B trading platform Udan, which raised $120 million in convertible notes and debt from existing shareholders and bondholders. D2C audio products brand both bagged $60 million from Warburg Pinkist and Malabar Investments. Personal hygiene brand Puri got $14.6 million from the likes of A91 Partners and Symphony International Holdings. That's not all. Devtron raised $12 million from Insight Venture Partners and retail tech startup Impact Analytics got $10 million from Argentum Capital Partners. Overall, the startup world saw a total of 986 deals this year so far, valued at nearly $21.8 billion. Well, on that note, uh, it is a wrap on this edition of Startup Street, but stay with us. More news and updates continue on CNBC TV 18.